everyone. Nikki Young here, back with episode two of my new true crime podcast, Serial Napper. Before we jump in, um, I wanted to take a second and thank everyone who listened to episode one, The Case of Lucy Blackman. The whole thing was far from perfect. It was my very first podcast ever recorded, um, but I did receive a lot of great feedback that I hope to incorporate into all the episodes going forward. I also just wanted to thank you for all of the love, the likes on SoundCloud, um, the likes on my Facebook page, all of the great feedback that I've gotten. It means the absolute world to me. Serial Napper is now available on iTunes, and I really want to amp this podcast up there, so I'm going to be having a giveaway. Um, I'm going to post all the details on my Facebook page, but I'm going to be giving away a true crime subscription box, and you're going to absolutely love it, trust me. So I will post all of the details of that giveaway on my Facebook page. If you don't know where to find me on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Serial Napper. So that's S-E-R-I-A-L Napper, N-A-P-P-E-R. Hope you're all keeping safe during these crazy times, and I really hope I'm able to provide you with a little bit of a distraction while you're probably stuck in the house. We're a month and a half into homeschooling here in Tokyo, and I've been hanging on to my podcast for dear life. So the case I'm covering today is one that I always knew I wanted to cover if I ever started my own podcast. Um, I had seen a documentary and listen to another podcast about this case. And it stuck with me for a really, really long time. It's a case that is technically solved, but after you hear all of the details surrounding the case, you'll be second guessing yourself. So I'm not gonna tell you my opinion of the case. Um, I want you to be able to form your own opinion and see what you think. And after you listen to this, please, you know, I'd love to hear feedback again on my Facebook page or anywhere else you might find me. So without further ado, let's talk about the case of Christian Andriacchio. You may or may not have heard about this story. It has been gaining attention within the last few years. Um, But it's definitely one that I think still requires attention, so here we go. A heads up, we're going to be talking about suicide, and at the end, I'll provide you with some places you can go if you feel like you need someone to talk to. Things aren't easy right now, but please know that you are never alone. Christian was a 21-year-old, fun-loving guy from Mississippi with the biggest smile. He was the middle child of three, an older brother, Josh, and a younger sister, Alexa. He was always the life of the party, and his family described him as a bit of a daredevil. But he was very loving and close to his whole family. He had an absolute heart of gold. He loved the lake and riding dirt bikes. He had a magnetic personality and a smile that could light up the room. I know that everyone says that when you listen to a lot of um, cases. When I post photos of him on my Facebook page, you're going to see exactly what I mean. He literally has one of the most gorgeous smiles I have ever seen. As an eager hard worker, he jumped at the opportunity to work on the tugboats. Christian loved working with his hands and picked up the job really easily, which helped him, helped him to move up the ranks very quickly. At just 21 years old, he was managing men who were at least 10 years his senior. It wasn't an easy job. He often worked 30 days in a row away from home on the boat, but he absolutely thrived in his position. He dated a girl named Avery through high school on and off for about five years. Avery has been described as completely opposite of Christian. She was quiet, more of a bookworm, but Avery's family still loved Christian and vice versa. Christian's family loved Avery. They say opposites attract, and that was absolutely the case with Christian and Avery. 
While everyone kind of thought that they'd be together forever, it wasn't to be. After their final breakup, the two still remained friends and her family even still kept in touch with him, sending him, you know, well wishes, um, wishing him happy birthday and things like that. There was always some kind of hope that maybe the two would find their way back to each other at some point. Shortly after the breakup with Avery, Christian started dating a younger girl named Whitley. Whitley had attended the same high school as Christian, however, at different times because of the age gap. Whitley couldn't be any more different than Avery. She was always in trouble. In fact, she had to wear an ankle bracelet to ensure she was at school because she had missed so many classes. Now, reading this, um, I don't know about you, but this isn't really a thing in Canada, I don't think. I'm not sure if placing a monitoring bracelet on your child is a thing that we do in Canada, but I probably would have had one if it were the case because I know I missed a lot of school myself. Christian's family thought she was a sweet girl at first, quiet, um, mild, meek, but there were a few red flags that it may have been an unhealthy relationship. Whitley seemed really immature, at times jealous, maybe a little too young for Christian. There was actually a situation where Whitley had found a picture of Christian and Avery um, at his parents' house, and she had taken the picture and stabbed holes through it. The breaking point came when Whitley had given Christian's little sister Alexa some Xanax. Alexa had never had Xanax before, and, and this was obviously completely inappropriate. So at that point, Christian's family kicked her out, which caused a lot of tension between Christian and his family. Christian moved out of his parents' house and into an apartment with his newly divorced older brother, Josh, who had a spare room in his place. With this newfound bit of freedom, Whitley spent a lot of time over at their house even with Christian working away from home the majority of the time. Imagine, you're a young teen like Whitley. You now basically have your own little freedom away from your parents' house, um, where your parents have been trying to reel you in a bit, and now you can basically do whatever you want. It was never the plan for Whitley to move in there, but she sort of showed up one day and never really left. Now, she had an older boyfriend who was working away most of the time, making great money, and she had access to his bank account. Christian had trusted her that much. He would have his paychecks deposited into his account, and Whitley was pretty good at spending it. But Christian had suspected that while he was away working, she may have been at home spending his pay on drugs. He even had his older brother, Josh, keeping an eye on Whitley and reporting back pretty much everything that she was doing, including if she was using drugs. At one point, Christian kicked her out of the apartment, but that didn't last long. Before he knew it, she was back in there. Christian had a life insurance policy, even though he was only 21 years old, which might sound a little bit weird to people, but his job was actually pretty dangerous, and he had fallen off the tugboat before. It's not something that Christian had to pay for. It was just sort of something given to him by his company, and it came with his job. He had his mother as the number one beneficiary if anything were to happen to him, and he put Whitley down as his second beneficiary, which, you know, is kind of weird considering she's 17 years old and the two had a really tumultuous relationship. On February 22nd, 2014, Christian boarded his tugboat for his next stint. With his money being spent back home and with worries that Whitley may have been cheating on him while he was working away, there was a ton of tension between the two of them. All of the lying and manipulating was starting to get a little bit old, and Christian was texting with his brother that he was planning to kick Whitley out for good once he got home from this job. It was finally going to be over for good. 
But then Christian caught word that Whitley had been seen driving around in Christian's Beamer with another guy. She also had been staying in Christian's room, even though she had been kicked out already. I can imagine this probably infuriated Christian. It may have been anger and, you know, it may have been jealousy. So on February 25th, he made up an excuse to his boss that he had an emergency he had to take care of back home, but he'd be back to work the next day. He had to make up an excuse to his boss because he was on a boat and it wasn't just easy for him to get off and go home. He made arrangements to have a friend, Dylan Swearingen, pick him up in Louisiana to bring him back to Mississippi. Dylan and Christian went to high school together and had played sports together, but it's unclear just how close the two friends really were. They did party a lot in their older years because they both liked to have fun, um, but that's really the extent of their relationship. February 26th, 2014, the very next day, Christian was found dead with a single gunshot wound to the head in his upstairs bathtub. He had collapsed into the tub with his upper body clumped over the drain. Only 45 minutes later, investigators declared his death a suicide. And while we don't know and may never know exactly what actually happened that day, we do have Whitley and Dylan's statements of facts. So here it goes. Um, this is going to surprise you a bit. I'm going to read you Dylan's statement first. He says, Christian called me at 1.37 a.m. asking if I was able to come pick him up at St. Rose, Louisiana at a docking bay that his barge had stopped. I told him, yes, I could pick him up. He told me that I needed to be there between 7.45 and 8 a.m. I left my house at 3.45 to 4 a.m. on my way to get him. We exchanged a few phone calls just to touch base, and he would ask me where I was or how far I was from the landing area. After a couple hours or so, I finally reached the destination that he was at. I called him when I arrived, and he said give him a few moments. When he came down the hill where I was parked and removed his blue jumpsuit he wore for his work, and said, he had left without permission and security of the place, along with a sheriff, were alerted, but he decided to leave anyway. I have no conclusion on whether he was able to leave or if he just left by self-choice. After we left the destination I picked him up at, we talked like we always have. Nothing was out of the ordinary. We stopped at a gas station and he got us some drinks. He filled up my truck for coming to get him. As we pulled out and got back on the interstate, he began to tell me that him and Whitley were having relationship issues. The issues were regarding another boy hanging out with Whitley while he was gone, and then he told me this was the reason for him coming home. Then we continued our route to Meridian, just talking and listening to the radio. We pulled into the apartment complex that he was living at. He noticed the BMW he bought for Whitley was there, and he walked in. He began asking her where she'd been because they have a tracker on each other's phones. That sounds healthy, doesn't it? She spent the night at the boy's house that Christian earlier mentioned. His name is Matt Miller. After asking her multiple questions regarding what she had done, she mentioned the usage of Xanax. She was not sure of some of the activities they had participated in, and he blamed Xanax for her not knowing. I stayed upstairs a majority of the time due to not wanting to interfere, interfere with their argument. I stuck my head over the stairs one moment and heard him saying over and over, do you love me? After a few times of asking, he pulled his gun out and cocked it and stuck it to his head and asked again, do you love me? She said yes and tried to grab the gun away from him. After a while, things calmed down and we watched a movie. I asked him if he wanted me to go get some food and give them a moment alone. He gave me his debit card and said, get some Chick-fil-A and to take all of his money out of his account. I asked him if he was sure and he replied yes. 
He also broke her phone in an earlier argument. I told him I would take the phone and see if they could fix it. I got the food and he provided me with the banking information, but they said as he was the account holder, he would have to withdraw the money himself. I came back and everything was fine. We watched another movie. I noticed they were leaving and I said, where are y'all going? He replied, to take a little ride. I fell asleep and woke up two hours later. Whitley was asleep and Christian was sitting on the couch smoking a cigarette. He acted normal and I said, I'm about to go to Best Buy and look at speakers. Do you need anything while I'm out? He replied, no. At an earlier time, after I saw him point the gun to his head, I took the gun from him and had placed it behind the curtains because he was acting very aggressive. As I left, I told him I hid it due to his actions, and I gave it back to him and told him, unload it and please don't touch it. As I left, I made it to Best Buy and talked to the car audio technician. As I walked in, I noticed he wasn't on the couch after arriving back from Best Buy. And I walked around the apartment calling him and got no answer. I walked up the stairs and noticed the bathroom light was on, so I figured he was taking a shower. I knocked and said, are you all right? Still no answer, so I walked downstairs and walked into the room that Whitley was sleeping in. I told her he didn't answer me and that we need to check on him. She went back to sleep and I walked back downstairs and knocked once more. I asked out loud again, Christian, are you okay? He didn't reply, so I opened the door and I saw Christian lying face down across the tub with blood in it. I yelled, Whitley, Christian is dead, we have to call 911. And she screamed and ran upstairs and began holding him. I then called 911 and directed them to the apartment and the police arrived and then took control of the scene and asked us to sit in the living room. Before we dissect this a little bit, um, let's turn to Whitley's statement of facts to get her version of events. Whitley says, Saturday the 22nd, also the day Christian left out for work at 5 a.m., that night I went to a Mardi Gras party with my family. He stopped talking to me starting at 1, the day he left for two more days. He has always had trust issues, and when I eventually got in touch with him, he said he would rather me be at home missing him and didn't want me going out from past issues we had without him. I contemplated breaking up with him and tried to convince myself we could work things out because a relationship without trust isn't a relationship, and we tried for so long to build up trust and be normal, but I love him. Last night, the 25th, he said he was coming home and quitting his job. I told him we could talk it out and there were some things we needed to work on before we could move on with our relationship. Today he came home early and he wanted to take a ride with me. We went to Bonita and he just said he felt like between me and his mom, he couldn't make anyone happy. I said uh, I laid down with my dog in our bedroom and Dylan, the guy who picked him up from work, woke me up. I went upstairs and found the love of my life face down, swooshed up into a puddle of blood. <sighs> so, I mean, wow. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, the police were called. They showed up and like I said... It literally took them 45 minutes to look at the scene and declare his death a suicide. <sighs> Some other factors um, will leave you kind of wondering if this really was a suicide besides their statements, which are a little iffy. So Christian, who is right-handed shot himself in his right temple. But the pistol actually ended up between his left leg and outside of the bathtub, which is really strange. The coroner ruled his death as undetermined, um, which is really weird because 
If it was a suicide, why wasn't it identified definitively as a suicide? The gun, and I don't know if I'm going to say this properly because I don't know a whole lot about a lot about guns, but a 45 Kimber semi-automatic 1911 pistol was found in an uncocked position with a live round in the chamber, um, which shouldn't have been the case if, if it had just been fired. When the police tested Whitley and Dylan's hands for gun residue, um, they actually found gun residue on both of them. Whitley had said that she was out, actually out shooting um, weapons earlier that morning, so that would explain the gun residue. Um, but there was a little bit of question as to whether this is actually true or not once the police spoke to Whitley's friends to talk about um, what had happened during their shooting and, and if Whitley had actually handled the gun. Some say that she did shoot the gun and some had said that she hadn't touched the gun at all. Gun residue was also found on the palm of Christian's hand. As you can imagine, Christian's family hired their own experts because they couldn't believe that it was a suicide. There was no indication that Christian was ever suicidal. He had actually been planning to go to a concert with his mom after he was done on his tugboat job. So the forensic experts hired by the Andriacchio family concluded that the blood splatter in the bathroom and the location of a bullet hole near an electrical outlet above the sink and behind Christian did not line up with what would have happened if he had shot himself while kneeling over the tub. It just didn't feel right, Christian's mother said. I was devastated. No mother should ever have to plan her son's funeral. But there were also a lot of red flags concerning my son's death. There was nothing that made me feel like this was a suicide. And I know a lot of people feel that way. You'll, you'll often see the family say things like that after a suicide. Um, they would have never killed themselves. I never saw this this coming. I mean, if you look at some of the famous people who have committed suicide, um, you'd never know, like, you know, Robin Williams, for example, no one would have guessed that. But I really do feel like if you were to look at the evidence in this specific case, there are so many questions that are just unanswered. And for them to only take 45 minutes to determine this is a suicide when there are two people in the house um it just doesn't seem like enough time and then dylan like why would christian tell dylan to take his bank card and go withdraw all of his money that seems really suspicious the case was eventually reopened, but in 2017, a jury chose not to indict either Dylan or Whitley in Christian's death. So to this day, um, it, it still says that this was a suicide and not a murder. They are the only two people who know and who may ever know what really happened to Christian. This is an insane case, and there are even more factors that will have you wondering if you really know the truth or if there were other people involved in Christian's death. Um, I want to give you some resources to look into because this case is absolutely not over, and um, a few other places really dive deep into this. Um, the podcast Culpable, I'll put a link to this podcast on my Facebook page. They do a really incredible job covering absolutely every single detail of the case. There's also a vlog posted by Kendall Ray on YouTube. Uh, it's incredibly well done and she actually talks to Christian's family. Um, it, it will break your heart but it's something that I, I really think you need to watch. So I'll post the link to that on my Facebook page as well. 
And of course, I love to hear your opinion. What do you think happened? Do you think it was a suicide? Do you think that there's more to this case? Um, leave me a comment on my Facebook page. I'd love to know what you think. Um, I, I really truly do believe there is more to this case than what we currently know. And I hope for Christian's sake and Christian's family's sake that someday the full truth will come out. I want to end this podcast by providing you with a few services that um, help you out if you if you're needing someone to talk to if you're feeling depressed if you're feeling suicidal there is always someone who can help the canada suicide prevention service is a 24 7 phone line that you can call anytime if you need any crisis support um, it is available in french and english the toll-free number is 1-833-456-4566 if you're international, you can always text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741-741 to reach a crisis counselor. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I appreciate your support, probably more than you'll ever know. And if you do want to reach me, you can always reach me on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash serial napper. So it's serial with an S-E-R-I-A-L napper n-a-p-p-e-r until next time guys stay safe out there stay healthy and i'll see you next time bye